Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, last week in our Five Practices series, we uh, discussed the practice of talking with people. Um, simple uh, and yet profound uh, kind of thing. And we asked the question, what kinds of conversations are you having with pre-Christians? And so, uh, how do those conversations go this week and everything in engaging the practice? Um, not necessarily asking you to tell stories right now in worship, but... Uh, uh, at the same time, I want to identify for you that this is an important thing that we can share with other Christians as a point of encouragement, as a point of mutual prayer and the like. And so, uh, just pointing you back toward one another uh, on that. Okay? Uh, today we look at another uh, incredible redemptive tool, prayer, and how we can minister or serve uh, through this great uh, gift and privilege of prayer. Okay? So, Jesus Jesus' uh, disciples came to him wanting to know how to pray. Don't you want to know? Huh? Isn't that kind of relevant to our lives today? What did Jesus tell them? Well, he gave them a prayer. Um, he gave them words. And so as we go through this, we're going to uh, begin to recognize kind of three different facets of uh, this practice of prayer. Okay? And the first one is just simply praying individually. Jesus gave his disciples a tool that they could use regardless of who they were with and everything. Kind of an incredible thing to have this intimate access to God the Father in this kind of way. Now, a couple of things about the Lord's Prayer. First of all, the words aren't necessarily completely original to Jesus, okay? Um, we shouldn't be uh, scared or worried about that, but it's just a recognition that Jesus himself kind of came up through uh, traditions, and he borrowed uh, from other things, and so he used portions of other contemporary prayers in order to sculpt out this prayer that the disciples were given over to pray, right? Um, and Jesus arranges it, though, uniquely in a way that focuses people people in on the kingdom of God, okay? That focuses them in on the kingdom of God. And he also assumes that this is not uh, the only prayer they're going to use. In fact, when Jesus has this conversation with the disciples, they're not asking from the standpoint of like, teach us, we don't know at all how to pray. What they're really kind of asking is, we already have this wealth of Jewish prayers, like the Amidah, that we pray on a regular basis, and they're kind of long. And our lives are busy. And so would you give us the Cliff Notes version like some of the other rabbis gave their disciples? Doesn't that all of a sudden sound pretty relevant to our lives? Our lives are busy. And so Jesus gave us the Cliff Notes version in the Lord's Prayer. The high notes. And so uh, here's what he gave them, right? Um, and so when we're thinking about this practice of prayer and how to engage it in our lives, it's very first importance is setting aside time and place to do it on a regular basis and pursuing it like no exceptions kind of thing, no excuses, with the same kind of intensity with which you, uh, you commit yourself to all the other daily stuff like food and sleep, because it's that important, okay? And it's not about impressing other people or earning gold stars with God or any of that kind of stuff. It's just, so it's not like the stuff that Jesus was kind of calling out in Matthew 6, but it's just to build on this relationship with God and to rely on him on a regular basis. And so, uh, if you're short on time, then you can simply pray the words of the Lord's Prayer and just pause on each of the petitions and kind of marinate on that a little bit. Um, but you can also, though, on a more regular basis, commit yourself to a little bit more extended time in prayer. And uh, there are lots of different models for that. Um, one of those is the Acts model of prayer, okay? Um, and so it goes like this, adoration. Jesus, you amaze me because of this aspect of your character and your story and who you are. Confession. Jesus, I'm so sorry for this way in which I just really messed up or I missed an opportunity. 
Thanksgiving, Jesus, thank you for this huge thing or this small thing that I haven't really taken time to recognize. Supplication. Jesus, I really need, or somebody near and dear to me really needs this. You fill in the blank. By the way, we're going this simple because these and thou's are optional in prayer, right? Um, you're not trying to impress anyone. So using simple language, and I'm hoping that this as well is a real transferable kind of thing for those of us with kids and grandkids and others that we're engaging, because this is pretty kind of base level uh, language stuff, right? Okay, so there we go. Uh, so praying individually, definitely. Uh, a starting point to commit yourself to doing that. But in addition to that, we pray in community, right? And so uh, how did the Lord's Prayer end, uh, which Joel shared with us uh, just now, right? What was the ending there that Jesus gave? Deliver us from evil or the evil one, right? That's the leave off. How do we end the Lord's Prayer? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, Catholics, they end it with the Jesus note, okay? Um, so we could say on this one point that Catholics are more biblical than Lutherans uh, in this, yeah, right, okay? Uh, so on this one point, we'll grant them that. Um, but uh, here's the thing. Why this benediction at the end? Why is it there? Well, it's there because it's a signal, that this was used in worship environments. This was a fitting finisher when people were gathered together in an environment like we were in. Uh, and so the early church started introducing this ending, right? And so this reminds us that prayer isn't just for individuals to do, but it's a group effort. It's a group work, okay? And so uh, we can be reminded through this doxology, ah, prayers for us together. Um, where do we use prayer? This amazing gift of prayer? Well, hopefully, first of all, in our family, in our homes, and uh, kind of just engaging it in the everyday rhythms of our lives. We referenced earlier, meals and bedtime. You wake up in the morning, start the day in brief prayer, an acknowledgement that God gave you that day, right? And so it can become a part of the rhythm. It doesn't have to be huge and involved or extended. Um, just can be a natural part of the flow. Secondly, uh, we pray if you're involved in like a small group or something. And so the leaders uh, pray out loud in those small groups. And you as well, if you're involved in a small group, can step up and pray along with the group, right? Um, so be challenged in that way. Also, we pray when we come together in worship. And uh, so this is an important aspect. And in worship, we pray together as the church of Christ with one voice. It's really a significant unifying move for us, that the concerns of the community are not just upon those individuals who brought those petitions, but it's that all of us are shouldering that together and praying with one voice and one spirit around those things. So, uh, that's the deal. We could also say that we could pray in groups if you start to acknowledge the maps around the space. Like, you could gather together intentionally and pray for the neighborhoods that you're a part of. Think on the people that you live close to and get together with them and pray about these neighbors that you brush shoulders with, you know? So lots of different ways to think about that. So those, in a sense, are easy ones, like the Lord's Prayer and Acts Prayer and kind of doing those things regularly, individually, and in community. Um, now here's the hard one, okay? Because this means that we start to go off script, which is harder. Remember, Jesus never intended the Lord's Prayer, though, to be the only thing we ever pray. It's just a summary. It's a template, okay? And there's a lot more involved. So, here's what happens. When we start to follow Jesus, we start doing the first three practices we've been talking about in this series as everyday missionaries. Here's what goes on. So you're seeking God's kingdom. That means you're opening your eyes and your ears to what God's doing around you and you're seeing important stuff in life like people instead of money, like forgiveness instead of revenge. And you're seeing all that much more clearly. Clearly. Add to that practice too, and you're hearing from Jesus. You're, you're putting your face in the Bible and being molded and shaped by Jesus' words, His sacrifice, His call to you. 
Right there, whole life has changed, right? The way you look at your spouse, the way you look at your kids or your coworkers or those political figures with crazy, crazy views, right? That's all transformed. Now we get to practice three, talking with people. And everything you've learned has a chance to express itself in this relationship context. You're finding time to spend with people, doing something enjoyable. Usually, usually there's food involved, really good food. Never hurts in terms of developing friendship and conversation, right? Um, so, and maybe in particular with this, you're gathered with people who you wouldn't normally have gathered with prior to your starting to seek the kingdom of God, right? In your everyday life. And over time, you simply develop a friendship. But now... This friend throws you a curveball. This friend you've been hanging out with uh, comes to you sharing a concern. And you're recognizing it as you're hearing it from them that it's beyond their ability to completely solve it. It's beyond their control in some way, shape, or form. And maybe you're also going, I could give them advice on this thing, but ultimately it's beyond my ability to control for them either. Flares should be firing at this point. When we recognize these kinds of things in our lives, like, God, I am out of control and I need somebody or something else to hold me together in my life, or when somebody else is coming to us in this kind of way, concerned, anxious, the flares fire because this is a God-sized need. We all have them. And so the best thing you can do is to invite God into it, to give it over to Him. The best thing any of us can do is to encounter God when we experience these kinds of needs, right? So what do we do when our friend throws us this curveball and comes to us in this kind of way, right? We go, hey, good luck with that, right? We kind of stare at them like deer in headlights, like, I have no idea what to say right now. Like, if maybe if I just stare awkwardly long enough, he'll know how inadequate I feel at this point, and then he'll move on himself. Or maybe you uh, pick up the cue yourself, and you abruptly change the conversation, and you're like, how about them hawks, right? You know? Or maybe you do the polite Christian thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'll pray for you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. No, I'm, I'm doing this recognizing that I have done that move as well as I'm imagining that most everybody in this room has pulled that move in some way, shape, or form. Like somebody shares a concern and you say, I'll pray for you later. Like when I get back to the safety of my car and you're in the safety of your car and then you'll never have to hear the awkwardness of kind of my cobbling words together in a prayer or what I imagine the train wreck of that moment to be. Right? Does this happen in our world? Absolutely. So we can own that. There is something universally kind of causing us trepidation about praying out loud together with other people. And it's normal. And you're not alone in it. But see, the thing is, praying out loud with people is only really scary one time. <laughs> And then you break the seal, and then you get a little bit of comfort with it, okay? And you give it over to God, and you allow Him to speak through you, and it, it does happen. And sometimes you get to the end of those prayers, and you have no idea what you said, but that person is grateful uh, for that, right? So the challenge is, when we say those kinds of polite Christian things, do we really mean them? Are we going to follow up with them? And can we do better? Is there another way, right? Is there more involved here to negotiate some of the potential awkwardness with praying together with other people? Um, one of our members, uh, Paul, he frequents uh, the bars uh, around Palatine quite frequently, uh, and he's sort of a pastor in the bars, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, right? Uh, he gains all these relationships with people through his winsome uh, attitude. I mean, he's just a fun guy. 
to hang out with. Uh, he's a great everyday missionary, and he's a trained Stephen minister, so that means he's a really skilled listener, all right, that comes alongside and cares for people. So he's talking in the bar one night with this guy who starts all of a sudden pouring his heart out to him. And he's just laying it on Paul, like, like Paul is actually his pastor or something, or a close friend, though not a close friend, actually. Uh, and so then Paul goes, whoa, that's a lot, right? Can I pray for you right now? And the guy goes, yeah, but we don't have to hold hands or anything, do we? That'd be weird, right? So, awkward. But here's the thing. He prayed right there in the bar, out loud with this dude, and they didn't even have to hold hands. And there in the bar, the king of kings showed up and attached himself to the concern. Beautiful, beautiful thing, right? So bottom line, we're all afraid on some level to pray out loud with other people. And it's normal, but we can overcome it with the Lord's strength. And why? Why would we dare to overcome it? Why would we dare to kind of push ourselves in that way? Because praying with someone out loud, one-on-one, -on -one, at a time of need, is an extremely powerful way that anyone can experience the goodness of God's kingdom right there in front of them. So how do you do this in a way that's not super awkward? Take a cue from Paul's story. It's something as simple as, wow, that's a lot to be going through. Can I pray with you right now? And if they say no, that's okay. They will appreciate the thought behind it. But if they say yes, then don't like totally freak out, right? Just keep it simple and short. You can say something like, Dear Jesus, you already know my friend has found out his wife has cancer. We're scared. We ask you to heal her and help us trust you as you work out your plan for her life. Amen. That's it. Immense world of difference. This is game changers, guys. Just moving from I'll pray with you to saying a simple prayer like that, that is worlds of difference. Now, I know that not all conversations like this take place face to face, person to person in the same way right now, right? Some of these things unfold on Facebook and through uh, extensive threads where people share things about their lives. Some of them take place via email email or text. The same can be true in those environments where somebody's laying out, I'll pray for you on this thing. You can embed, like you can throw something in there, like an actual prayer that then invites the king in to those spaces. Think of the power of that. See, so it, it actually, this practice of prayer isn't just for the extroverts and the more daring among us. There are different ways to engage it and honor who God's made you to be as an introvert as well. You can go old school and pen pal style. But you're giving somebody written verbiage that not only shows that you care about them, but gives them something that they can revisit and think about this. If they've never prayed before in their life, or they're really not comfortable with it at all on a personal basis, you're actually modeling for them what that can look like. And you're showing them what a relationship with God can be like. Powerful, powerful thing. So while people may be thankful for generic thoughts and prayers, you can give them something so much better, something that can change their eternity because praying with someone one-on-one -on -one at a time of need is an extremely powerful way that anyone can experience the goodness of God's kingdom in their everyday life. And when people encounter the king, which is what happens in prayer, then he, not you, can transform their lives for eternity. 
So that's it. That's prayer, right? Praying individually, praying in community, praying with anyone, anywhere, right? There's a handout at the Connection Center when you leave today if you want to pick it up for some of the script and stuff that I've thrown up on the screen uh, to help you along with uh, prayer prompts, okay? So the challenge is just go and do the practice, right? See what a game changer it can be in your world. Next week, we're going to finish up this series uh, where we're talking about doing good in the neighborhood, okay? Uh, so that's the deal. And all God's people said, amen.